Welcome to the Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe to the studios of our flagship stations, Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM. In addition today, as always, we are on TV in West Bloom, in the Bloomfield Hills and in the Birmingham area on Birmingham Area Municipal Access. We are also in Southfield on their, on their station, City TV 15, as well as on Waterford Community Television out in Waterford. Both those TV stations joining us for the first time this week. We welcome them to the Megacast family of television, radio, and other media outlets. We're also on the radio on 88.1 WBFH, the Biff out of Bloomfield Hills. That a service of the Bloomfield Hills School District with live programming from students all afternoon from 3 p.m. until 9 p.m. and then DJ Automation from 9 p.m. until we come on the next morning at 10 a.m. We're also online, civiccentertv.com. Click on our Megacast link and learn more about our show or watch or click on the Watch Live link during our live programming Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 12 noon to watch the Megacast live and throughout the afternoon for replays of the Megacast as well as other original programming and municipal meetings from West Bloomfield, Kego Harbor, Orchard Lake, and Sylvan Lake. That and at civiccentertv.com slash megacast. Cast. You can learn more about all of our partnering television and radio stations such as My Michigan TV, another internet outlet that joins us each and every day with free streamed content from all across the state of Michigan about the state of Michigan from creators right here in the Great Lakes State. You can learn more about them at MyMITV.com, my, my MyMITV.com, or by going to CivicCenterTV.com, clicking on our Megacast link, and then selecting the link that goes to My Michigan TV, where you can learn more about all their programming, view some of our segments and their other shows on demand, and find out where you can get my, my TV on your mobile phone as well as on the web and on your smart TV. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Also learn more about our other partnering stations, such as the BIF, such as Birmingham Area Municipal Access. This week we'll also put information up there about Southfield and Waterford's community television stations as well, so you can familiarize yourself with more of our partnering stations as we continue to expand the Megacast network each and every day. Then. We also have links to our full interviews as well as our full episodes each and every day. So if you can't tune in 10 a.m. to 12 noon, Monday through Friday, every single day, or even on just a few days, you have other things that come up. We understand. It's okay. We still, we still welcome you to join us. You can join us anytime on our website, civiccentertv.com slash megacast. We usually post our full episodes and have our full interviews posted sometime in the in mid to late afternoon by the end of our regular business hours here at Civic Center TV each day at 5 o'clock, and you can view those on demand on your time. So if you would rather watch our live shows the day after at 2 o'clock, you can do that through our YouTube page, through our Civic Center TV website, by clicking on Megacast and selecting full episodes. Or maybe there are only certain interviews that are really interesting to you. Maybe you really want to hear from the Michigan Democratic Party today and get their perspective on a number of different issues. We're going to be joined by Lavora Barnes, the chair of the Michigan Democratic Party, uh, just after this first segment. And that will be listed later on today. Or maybe you know, we had an interview yesterday with the Real Men of Orion talking about their uh, ongoing fundraiser for the American Cancer Society that features a number of events throughout Lake Orion and the surrounding areas. Maybe that's something that really is important to you, important to your community, important to your heart and your family. You can find that interview on our website, civiccentertv.com slash megacast and click on the watch full interviews link and find all of that as well as information on our partnering stations that provide great programming all throughout southeastern Michigan and in Oakland County. And then right next door to our megacast page on civiccentertv.com just to the left or just above on the left uh, panel of the screen if you're, if you're viewing our website on your mobile phone is civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus or just click on our coronavirus link and that will take you to a very helpful website Web page that has information from the Centers for Disease Control, the state of Michigan, Oakland County, and many of our local municipalities here in Oakland County where we broadcast out of, so that you have accurate, 
up-to-date information about COVID-19 directly from frontline sources that are researching COVID-19, the vaccines, precautions that can be taken, providing you with data on numbers, hospitalizations, vaccination rate, and so on and so forth, as well as information about variants, because the Delta variant is certainly not going to be the last variant of COVID-19 that we experience during this pandemic. It's inherent in nature that these that COVID-19 is going to continue to have variations as times go on and that those are going to have different effects than the ones before them. So whether it's Delta variant or one of the other variants coming up, you can learn more about those from reliable sources that actually know this information, that are actually researching this information, that are conducting these, story, these studies or are at the very least confirming or backing up these studies that are being done that provide information to the public so that you can make informed decisions in your life about what are the best precautions for yourself and your family to take out in public when you should and maybe should not wear, ma wear masks whether you should or should not be vaccinated because some people should, some people shouldn't, who you should consult with, what are some of the questions you should ask, and it answers some of your questions as well about things such as the COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, on the Oakland County website, you can get in contact with their nurse on call hotline to answer a lot of your questions and uh, ask questions about things such as Oakland County's school mask mandate, uh, why that was put in place, where, uh, when it would theoretically be in a position to be uh, taken out of mandate down the line, which hopefully would happen sooner rather than later. All those questions can be answered through just a few simple links on our website at civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, where we also post articles each and every day about our top stories on those individual days right under all that information and today we'll start off with some new information about COVID-19 in schools as we have now fully begun the 2021-2022 school year. New COVID-19 outbreaks in Michigan schools have more than tripled in one week. That being said, uh, most of the schools at this point have begun class and in the past couple of weeks there's only been a select number of schools. So those numbers have, are inherently going to rise at least slightly as you have more schools and more students back in the classroom. There's a high, higher likelihood of there being outbreaks and there being cases. This article from our friends over at the Detroit News. 31 new COVID-19 school outbreaks were reported on Tuesday by state health officials, a more than threefold increase from last week's numbers. The state reported 26 new outbreaks at K through 12 schools, two at higher in, uh, education institutions, one at an administrative building, and two at intermediate school, dis uh, school districts. Last week, there were only nine new outbreaks. The largest K-12 outbreak is at Adams Elementary School in Midland, where 23 cases, including students and staff, were reported. Two other Midland Elementary schools also reported outbreaks of six and five cases, respectively. The largest university outbreak is at Eastern Michigan University, where 16 student cases uh, were found last week. Adrian College has 11 cases involving students. Three Oakland County high schools also reported new outbreaks, those being Avondale High School in Auburn Hills with four cases, Marion High School in Bloomfield Hills with three cases, and Troy High School with two cases as well. A COVID-19 outbreak was reported among football players at Detroit Renaissance High School last week. The Detroit Public Schools Community District website listed 10 student cases and said 40 others were in quarantine. The state reported six cases at the school on Tuesday. State officials also reported 13 ongoing school outbreaks compared to four last week. An outbreak at the University of Michigan has grown from 86 to 172 cases among its undergrads and its staff at Howell High School. An ongoing outbreak uh, currently contains 14 students. Michigan added 6,313 COVID-19 cases and 29 deaths from the virus on Tuesday, including totals from Saturday, Sunday, and Monday of this week. Usually those totals come in on Monday from over the weekend and the Friday before. In this case, Labor Day was on Monday, so it's including the weekend numbers as well as Monday numbers in the report from Tuesday. Amid concerns over the most contagious, more contagious Delta variant, the latest 
tallies from the State Department of Health and Human Services push the overall totals to 961,953 cases and 20,396 deaths since the virus was first detected in the state of Michigan in March of 2020. The average total number of new confirmed cases is 1,578 per day over the past four days. Of the deaths announced on Tuesday, 10 were identified during a vital records review as reported by the State Department of Health and Human Services. Those vital records reviews are all are uh, of course after the fact determinations that deaths were caused as a result of COVID-19 and not of other complications that may have uh, or in addition to other complications that may have led to those deaths. That a full article from the D Detroit News on our website at civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. And of course, staggering numbers as there's a threefold increase in school outbreaks. But as I said before the article, before I read from that Detroit News article, that's something you have to come to expect as we have more schools get in session, more students be in the classroom, more faculty back in the building, and more intermingling of people in these facilities over the course of time. That being said, with most schools, or in this case, all schools in the state of Michigan, now pretty much in session as of this week, uh, the, the benchmark we really are going to be looking at is over the next couple of weeks, particularly two weeks from now when we get past that gestation period uh, that usually takes uh, these cases to really take a toll on people to be reported and people to be testing positive. So if we continue to see a rise in these cases and a rise in outbreaks, uh, especially at this rate over the next couple of weeks, I think that would be a lot more of a concern than it is right now. That being said, any outbreaks, any cut spread of COVID-19, especially the Delta variant, given the status of all but two of Michigan's counties still being classified as high or substantial spread of COVID-19, spread of COVID-19 in any shape or form, especially in our schools, given what we've been through over the last two school years in our school buildings and what our students have had to endure and our teachers and our faculty have had to endure, those are going to be alarming. And so we'll definitely keep an eye on that, continue to report those numbers to you as we get updated on them and definitely encourage you to subscribe and to follow these uh, journalists on the local level who are keeping up with these numbers, who are on the front lines getting this information from these sources and doing the digging that we're simply reporting over here each and every day during our short 20 minute opening and headlines segment of the show. Definitely encourage you to subscribe and support local journalists who are doing amazing work right here in our communities, for our communities, and for people like you and I who are reading the papers each and every day as we should be to keep informed on top of watching shows like this. Other news at civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. If you uh, didn't hear the thunder and the lightning and the rain last night, you probably weren't listening or you had a really good distraction. Uh, so, some, some headphones and some music really do some joys for you, but not for everybody. 39,000 people out of power after Tuesday night storms. This from the Oakland Press on our website at civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. The series of storms that moved over the area on Tuesday evening and knocked out power, uh, knocked out power to thousands of residents throughout the southeast Michigan region. DTE reported that it has 573 cr crews working uh, and had them working before 8 a.m. on Wednesday, having already restored power to more than 19,000 customers this morning. Shortly after 9 a.m., less than 40,000 outages remained in southeastern Michigan. The bulk of the outages run along the west to east path from Brighton through Pontiac and into the Rochester area and Utica. Most of the outages did not yet have an estimate for restoration. The series of storms on Tuesday brought high winds, heavy rains, and uh, lightning and thunder as well. Other outages are scattered in western Wayne County, including in Redford, Garden City, and Woodhaven. The weather on Wednesday is starting off much more mild uh, than the last major outage from the storm. The temperatures in the morning were in the low 60s, and highs today are expected to reach the mid-70s, according to AccuWeather.com. Uh, WDIV, that is Local 4 Television, reported an, a dozen school closures confined to single buildings rather than districts due to building problems as a result of the inclement weather. Power outages have occurred through the state uh, throughout the state as Consumers Energy reported 47,000 uh, bus uh, businesses without power uh, and homes without power as of 8 a.m. on Wednesday, uh, with, Mich with mid-Michigan especially impacted. On Tuesday night, at the height of the outages, more than 150,000 customers were without power, according to the Associated Press. So power outage issues continue 
to be common here in the state of Michigan over this summer and as we head into the fall uh, and get toward the end of the severe weather season and it's caused a lot of frustration definitely over the month of months of June and July where we had a string of major storm after major storm after major storm and a series of hundred year floods that were classified then as thousand year floods and it brings up more of the issues, of course, of infrastructure that relates to those floods, but on the power outage issue, it's definitely put a lot of pressure on energy providers like DTE Energy, like Consumers Energy, as well as on the local level to address some of these power outage issues. Because especially in the times that we're in now, uh, having been what we've been through over the last year and a half plus with COVID-19 and the ways that this is definitely changing our society and really it's going to continue to change the paradigm of our society going forward with more people working remotely, uh, educating themselves remotely and having jobs that really jobs and other parts of their life that really rely on having reliable access to electricity on a consistent level even with these storms so we expect outages you have to expect to have some hiccups when there's inclement weather but this consistency of inclement weather and consistency of outages is going to continue to be a frustration for a lot of people especially those 150,000 uh, Michigan residents last night who did lose power as a result of those storms of course many of them uh, already back and restored with their power as crews were out as early as 8 a.m. this morning at least in the case of DTE energy and hopefully we'll be able to restore or most of those people's power, if not all of them, sometime today, especially given that the weather is going to uh, at least looks pretty clear on this beautiful Wednesday here in Michigan. Lastly, on our website, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, more frustration with the Michigan Independent uh, Citizens Redistricting Commission as they are now a subject of a lawsuit in, anticip in anticipation of missing their constitutional deadline. Serial litigant uh, Robert Davis sued Michigan's redistricting commission on Tuesday for moving ahead with a schedule that will have the group missing the constitutional deadlines for proposing and adopting new maps for the state's legislative and congressional districts. This article from the Detroit Free Press. Michigan's constitution requires the Michigan Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission to adopt the new districts no later than November 1st after providing the state with at least 45 days for a public comment period to comment on proposed maps. But the commission is expected to blow past the September 17 deadline for drawing new maps. The co commission has anticipated it would miss the deadline because of an unprecedented delay in census data and, move, and moved forward with an alternative mapping schedule instead. In suing the commission, Davis of Highland Park called on the Supreme Court of the state of Michigan to require the commission to meet their deadlines of September 17th and November 1st. In his complaint, Davis wrote that the commission quote, has chosen to deliberately ignore the clear mandate, in close quote, in the state's constitution. He continued on, quote, such deliberate and unlawful conduct should not be tolerated by this court, uh, in close quote. He wrote, the first ever independent group of randomly selected voters tasked with redrawing the state's political lines was established after voters in 2018 backed a constitutional amendment to take away redistricting responsibilities from state lawmakers. The commission is seen as a corrective to gerrymandering the practice of drawing lines as an advantage to a political party. Usually that is the political party that is in power in one state government or the other. In this case uh, right now, for example, that would be uh, a gerrymandering would be if the state Republican legislature was redrawing the lines in favor of the Republican Party, that would be considered gerrymandering. Uh, with this redistricting commission being that it's made up evenly of Republicans, Democrats, and independent voters that are selected at random, uh, although with even numbers to total out the commission, that is supposed to be uh, with a purpose of preventing such gerrymandering. The article continues on, Davis's complaints uh, state that the voters in Michigan changed the Constitution, quote, with the understanding that the amendments contained mandatory deadlines, and closed quote. Davis expressed concerns that if the commission moves ahead with a delayed redistricting schedule, it will shorten the period of time to mount legal challenges to, to the new maps and undercut the ability of potential candidates for office to gather the required number of signatures from voters in these new districts. The commission proactively petitioned the Supreme Court for a deadline extension for proposing and adopting new districts, but, it, but its request was denied in July. In the face of active legal challenges, it is unclear whether the High Court will allow the Commission to proceed with its current schedule, which has the Commission launching the 45-day public comment period on November 14th and considering a vote on the adoption of final maps on December 30th. 
The commission's general counsel, Julianne Pastula, told the Supreme Court in late June that the census delay was, quote, a rare and extreme circumstance, and closed quote, that justified the commission's request to the court for a delayed deadline. Uh, in a quote from, from uh, their attorney, she said, quote, when the people enacted the constitutional amendment, there was no way that they could foresee this would ever happen, a close quote. Redistricting authorities across the country have had to contend with the truncated timeline for crafting new districts because of the census delay. Federal law requires that the Census Bureau shares the redistricting data with states by April 1st this year following the conclusion of the decennial count of the U.S. population. But census officials have said that the pandemic, wildfires, hurricanes, and civil unrest made the, the meeting of that deadline impossible. Census data was then released instead on August 12th of this year. In his complaint, Davis argues that the commission received the data with sufficient time to meet the November 1st deadline. Since the group began drawing maps, commissioners have repeatedly raised concerns that the process isn't moving efficiently as the inaugural group has had to work collaboratively to draw lines that, the, that consider public input and maps sub, uh, submitted by the public as well as racial and partisan voting data. So on one hand, the commission has, meet, has been missing all of its deadlines. It has been consistently inconsistent in its approach to filing these maps. But on the other hand, the census data delay is a huge, huge obstruction to their process moving forward and to make sure that they are making informed decisions that do take into account changes in population, that do take into account demographics, that do take into account a number of other factors that are then exemplified by U.S. Census data. And when that data is several months late, in this case, it's due in April. It wasn't in April. It wasn't in May. It wasn't in June. It wasn't in July. It didn't come until five months and 11 days later than was expected. And then from there, they're supposed to go from August 12th through uh, through September and uh, through really a month and five days to make their first deadline through the Michigan State Constitution and, and have their final maps determined by November just a couple of months later. That is a really tough task, especially for a commission that has had so many absences, uh, that have in many cases been chronic and had a lot of delays and a lot of uh, inefficiencies in its process altogether. So there's really two sides to this. There's the due frustration with the Michigan Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission for their delays, for their inefficient uh, processes. But on the other hand, there should be some sympathy and some relief there as well because they are, for lack of better terms, doing their best with the circumstances that have been handed to them as the U.S. Census data was severely delayed due to the pandemic, both in getting that data into the Census Bureau and finalizing that process, and then on top of that, tallying all the numbers and releasing that data to the powers that be and to the general public in a timely manner as well. When that's five months late, it's definitely going to cause a hiccup in processes that rely on it. All of those headlines and more, as well as these full articles from our friends at a number of different news outlets here in southeastern Michigan throughout the state on our website, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, in addition to all those helpful links to the Centers for Disease Control, the state of Michigan, Oakland County, and many of our local municipalities so that you can stay informed about COVID-19 and other issues that are affecting your community each and every day. We have a great show ahead, as I mentioned earlier. We'll kick off the show here in a few minutes with Lavora Barnes, the chair of the Michigan Democratic Party. At the bottom of the hour, we will then shift gears and we'll be speaking, uh, sorry, at the bottom of the hour, we'll shift gears as we head into the second hour. We'll speak with Oakland County Prosecutor Karen McDonald. Uh, before the end of the hour, however, we'll be speaking, we'll, we'll go in between our political discussions. We'll talk about scams with Melanie Ducanel from the Michigan Better Business Bureau, uh, who will join us once again on the program. Then in the 11 o'clock hour at 11.20, uh, Gina, uh, Gina Cal Spain, the co-founder and president of New Day Foundation for Families Fighting Cancer, will join us to talk about her organization. And then we'll cap off the show today with our friends out in Southfield. We'll speak to, to the mayor of Southfield at 11.40. All of that coming up next. You're watching and listening to the Megacast. <laughs> One of the things you can look for in your friends is a change in behavior. These can be big changes, they can be small changes in mood, 
physical appearance. They may be sleeping less or sleeping more, drinking more, or their eating patterns may be different. One big change that can be pretty obvious is change in motivation. Do they no longer want to play basketball? Do they no longer want to play video games? Now that we're spending more time online and in virtual settings, it's really important to pay attention to the language that your friend is using and the words they're using to communicate. So when we text our friends, are they taking longer amounts of time to respond? Are they not responding at all? You don't have to be an expert to try to recognize these signs. The second that you feel it in your gut and that you're concerned, that's the second to have the conversation and open the door to what might be going on. Whatever, whatever, whatever gets you talking. Today, it is easier than ever to join Michigan's Organ Donor Registry and help build a bridge of hope for organ, tissue, and eye donation. Just one person can potentially save or help improve the lives of up to 75 people. By joining, your legacy could be the gift of life. Sign up today at michigan.gov SOS or at any of the more than 145 Secretary of State self-service stations located across Michigan. Be part of Michigan's Bridge of Hope by adding your name to the organ donor registry. Welcome back to the Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe, alongside board operator and studio producer Calvin Brown. Here in our studios are our flagship station, Civic Center TV, and 89.3 Lakes FM, located in West Bloomfield Township on the campus of Chico Elementary School. Uh, here on Walnut Lake Road as we continue to broadcast the Oakland County Megacast and really a statewide Megacast at this time uh, each and every day. Live from 10 a.m. to 12 noon, find our replays and more information about all of our partnering uh, media outlets, TV, radio, and internet on our website, civiccentertv.com slash megacast. LaVora Barnes, our first guest, is the chair of the Michigan Democratic Party. She was elected in February of 2019 and is the first black woman to hold this post. She joins us once again now on the megacast as we are heading into a very important and uh, what's uh, what, what seems like it's going to be a very competitive political year once again. LaVora, thanks for being with us today. Great to be back with you guys. Good to see you. So let's start off with what we were talking about before the break. That last article I read from our friends yeah. over at the Detroit Free Press about the Michigan Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission. There's a lot of due frustration that is being tossed yeah. their way as there have been a number of delays. There's been a, a lot of reported inefficiencies in their process as well as um, uh, among some of the commissioners themselves. What, what's the Michigan Democratic Party's take on, on what has been happening so far with the Michigan Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission? Because on one hand, this is, at least seems like it is the best path forward for Michigan voters to be avoiding gerrymandering, whether it be Democrat or Republican now mm -hmm. and in the future. But on the other hand, it's been a very messy process through their first set of uh, redistricting maps. It's 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 funny. This is truly sausage making, right? Yeah. Folks are actually watching this happen as it goes. And you know, we we were proud to support the the idea of the commission when when it was working its way through the, the voters. And we are really thrilled that this commission is in place, and um, we support the work that they're doing. And it's so important that we draw these lines fairly and without the influence of the elected officials who would sit in these districts once they are drawn. Um, it has been frustrating to watch. I understand that, and it's probably frustrating to them for this process to 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 draw out the way it is. It is tough work drawing districts, and it's even tougher work drawing districts publicly um, together as a group instead of individually. And I think that they just need um, probably to just get this process a little bit tighter so that they can move through this process faster. I would love to see them, you know, taking a look at partisan fairness while they're drawing. I think that the plan right now is for them to go back and look at partisan fairness after they've drawn some of these maps. Um, it makes more sense to me to be looking at it while you're drawing the maps so that you're drawing these maps fairly as you go along. Um, but we're watching it closely. We've got lots of our members participating in public comment and we'll continue to do that and um, we, we look forward to seeing what these fair maps look like when they're finished. And you have to expect some hiccups especially when a lot of the data that they rely on to make a lot of these decisions is based off yeah. of U.S. the most updated U.S. Census data. In this case that data was yeah. due to be sent out to these powers that be including commissions like this and to state legislatures across the union on April 1st and what ended up happening is that deadline was not missed what was missed by the Census Bureau due to a 
number of factors, mostly surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic, as is claimed right. by the Census Bureau. And by the time that that data was out, it's five months plus later, it's August 12th. That really makes yeah. for a difficult situation here. But the fact of the matter is they do have those numbers. They are, they, they do. do have a month after those numbers are, are out there and that they have time to deliberate on them and look them over and make at least initial drawings before that 45 day public comment period is opened up. And so they are able to take a look at those things such as political lines in these certain areas, at least among those that did report their political affiliations uh, in the US Census Bureau or through other means. So at this moment in time, uh, they have plenty of that data to move forward, especially right now, given the situation that we're in um, yeah. and the last few political cycles that we've had through the gubernatorial election, certainly the 2020 presidential election. And with the data we've seen so far from the US Census Bureau that's reporting such changes in the demographics of a lot of our communities with growing diversity. How much more yes. important now is it for a commission like the Michigan Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission to make sure that they get this right, but get it right yeah. in a timely manner as we approach a major election season here in the state of Michigan? It's so important. We've been through so many cycles under these gerrymandered maps that were um, drawn during that, that after that 2010 census. And you know, if you look at the numbers, um, you see Democrats winning statewide. Um, but then, as you get down to legislative districts, the disparity is great, and that is because of how these maps were gerrymandered to favor Republicans. And we are hoping right now for fair maps. That's all we're asking for. We're not asking them to draw although I would love it if they did draw a bunch of Democratic maps, but uh, I want fair maps, right? I wanna make sure that um, if, if when we run the next time, we're running under some fair circumstances that the finger's not on the scale for either one party or the other. This group of folks, these group of citizens who have stepped up to do this work, um, I'm, I'm thrilled that they're doing it. And I know that in the end, with the help of the terrific Secretary of State staff who's supporting them, um, they're gonna come up with some good maps, but we've got to be patient with them and we've got to provide input to them so they know what people of Michigan want, which is why we're encouraging folks to, to come out, to show up for the public comment, to send in maps that they've drawn themselves, maps that they think would be fair to their communities, maps that represent their communities of interest, maps, maps that represent partisan fairness to help this commission do the work that they're trying to get done because they don't have a lot of time to get it done. We need we need to follow these deadlines as closely as possible so that we are ready to run elections because 2022 will be here before you know it. We're joined by Lavora Barnes. She is the chair of the Michigan Democratic Party with us today on the Megacast and continuing on the issue of redistricting and, uh, and on gerrymandering. There was an article that I mentioned before from the Detroit Free Press that uh, centered around Robert Davis, a man from Highland Park that is suing the uh, Michigan Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission and petitioning the Supreme Court to require that the commission meet both its September 1st and November 1st deadlines. Is the Michigan Democratic Party in line with, with that argument? Do you, d does the party hope and really in, in, or maybe even in a more severe case demand that that these deadlines are made as as close as possible because as you said that severely impacts the 2022 election cycle which does begin late in 2021 with primaries it does begin pr pretty quickly here. And um, we, we want very much to see these maps drawn in a timely manner. Um, more important to me though, is that they are drawn in fair and that the, the redistricting commission takes the time they need to make sure that they're drawing good, fair maps for us. And if that means they need to get the Supreme Court to give them more time to draw those maps, that's what they should be asking the Supreme Court to do. And I believe that's what the court will do when it becomes apparent that they cannot meet these deadlines. We're joined by Lavora Barnes. She is the chair of the Michigan Democratic Party with us today on the megacast and on the issue of voting rights. It's become more mm -hmm. of a hot button issue across the United States over the past year, certainly since the conclusion of the 2020 uh, presidential election with uh, what really what, what began as a battle after that in Georgia and in other states that were highly contested between uh, former President Donald Trump and current President Joe Biden. We've seen a number of different bills pop up, particularly the one that's been talked about most are the voting bills in the state of Texas, at least as of late. In Michigan, uh, Republicans have filed the secure, have launched Secure My Vote, Secure MI Vote Drive to reform Michigan election laws, uh, launching petition to drive tighter state voting laws following uh, that combative 2020 election, where many of them, uh, of those in the Republican Party, claim that there was fraud in the state of Michigan, although those, those claims have, by and large, or entirely been unsubstantiated. 
what are your thoughts on these drives to further secure, so to speak, the voting laws in the state of Michigan and in other places, uh, as opposed to making it easier and for people to have access to the vote, but also do so right. legally? You know, in, in overwhelming numbers in 2018, the voters of Michigan decided to make it easier for folks to vote, to give folks better access to the ballot. And, and this effort is to overturn that clear vote that the Michigan voters made in 2018. Um, I've said this so many times, but it, it's what the Republicans' playbook seems to be that first they lose and then they lie, that big lie about what happened in 2020, and then they try to change the rules, they cheat. Um, and this is the next step in that cheat. This is a deceptive effort to overturn what the people of Michigan decided they wanted and to even go even further backwards in terms of access to the ballot. I believe it to be a constitutional violation of rights. I think that we're putting barriers to voting that should not be there and that our Constitution protects voters from having in their way. Um, they have, we, we have a, a, a right to vote, we have a freedom to vote, and we should be allowing our folks to have access to that ballot without these barriers that the Republicans want to throw up in front of them. We're joined by Lavora Barnes. She is the chair of the Michigan Democratic Party with us on the Megacast. Just a little bit of information about what this uh, Secure My Vote initiative from the Michigan Republican Party would do. According to the outline shared with Bridge Michigan Magazine, the, initi the initiative would uh, require in-person voters to pre present a photo ID. Acceptable forms would be a driver's license, state ID card, passport, military ID, tribal ID, or student ID issued by a university, junior college, or community college. It would require require voters applying for an absentee ballot to include their driver's license or state ID number along with the last four digits of their social security number. It would prohibit the Secretary of State and local election clerks from sending absentee ballot applications to voters who did not request them specifically. Uh, prohibit outside corporate entities, and closed quote, from funding Michigan elections and create a new, quote, voter access fund with $3 million to provide free state ID cards to residents who may struggle to obtain one because of financial hardships. So on one hand, these are new restrictions. They would, in this case, should any of these initiatives ultimately be, become law in the state of Michigan, would in some ways make the process of getting voters to the polls and having their votes be counted more difficult. But on the other hand, there are some proposals in this initiative, such as those $3 million to help provide state IDs that would provide some of those necessary materials to people that may not have access to be able to get state IDs or to get a driver's license because of financial hardships or others that are in place. So is there a balance here where we can provide greater security to our election, but also provide greater freedom and access to elections for those that qualify and maybe have had act, uh, issues with access to getting their votes heard in past elections. So, so what this 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 proposal would do um, is is. It, it, it suggests to folks that there's something wrong with our elections that needs to be fixed, that our elections aren't already secure, that we don't already have effective voter IDs and ID laws in place that work. The fact of the matter is that our, our elections are secure. Um, we just ran the biggest, most secure election in 2020 that we've ever run because of our terrific nonpartisan Republican and Democratic clerks all over the state who do this work and do it well because of our terrific Secretary of State who is the best in the nation at what she does and she does it well. We have voter ID laws already that work. We know that, that the idea here is to scare people, to make people think that there is something wrong with the way our elections work, that there's something wrong with receiving an absentee ballot application in the mail when in fact there is nothing. It isn't about um, securing our elections. It's about sowing seeds of doubt about our elections so that they can continue the big lie, which is that there was something wrong with the 2020 election, and when they lose again, they're going to say there was something wrong with that election as well. And, and it's something that we see, in, in all fairness, it's something that we see across the aisle, whether it's in 2020 with, yeah. with the big lie following the results of the 2020 election, which were substantiated state to state and federally, uh, and, and the results were clear. Joe Biden won through all the legal means that were in place, the election over Donald J. Trump, but we had similar situations in 2016, those being, uh, being significantly less drastic, I would say, than the results uh, 
uh, in the qualms with the 2020 election result, where it was mostly about questions of the efficacy of the Electoral College. But no matter what's going to happen, one side's going to be the winner, one side of the aisle is going to be the loser, and the other side that, that doesn't get what they want out of an election is going to be frustrated. That being said, we can find balance and without restricting people uh, and their ability to, to vote, because it is the hallmark of our political system, not only here in the state of Michigan, but throughout the Republic. We're joined by Lavora Barnes, the chair of the Michigan Democratic Party, with us on the megacast and Lavor, just a few more minutes with you today. Uh, so I want to talk about an issue that's growing in its importance to a lot of people uh, and it's in the severity and the urgency of addressing this issue at a national level, and that is, and that is uh, the, the status and the danger behind, and the uh, growing concern about the potential repeal of Roe versus Wade at the federal level through the Supreme Court. And that would af affect people in the state of Michigan as well, because if that federal precedent would to be, were to be removed by the Supreme Court, and it is in some ways expected that is, that, that is impending sometime in, in the next year or so, that laws at the state level because of of the Constitution being that any powers not given to the not, not uh, provided through the federal government and then fall onto the state would then fall back to a Michigan law from 1930 from 19 from the 1930s uh, that that um, of course bans abortions in the state of Michigan how much of a major issue or, or at, at what stage is this major issue is this issue a major issue to the Michigan Democratic Party? Is it one of your top priorities right now? Is it a growing priority as we approach potentially the repeal of Roe versus Wade at the federal level? Yeah, we, we as a party believe in a woman's fundamental right to govern her own body and, and make choices about it without interference of government or elected officials. We continue to believe that. I think yesterday you saw our governor step up and say, it's time to reveal, repeal those vote those ballots Mm, those laws that are on the books here in Michigan. Um, we support that. We want those 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 laws repealed. Erica Geis, Senator Geis, has legislation to do that, and we encourage um, the legislature to move on that legislation and repeal this. This is an issue that is fundamental to us as women. Um, to me, as a mother and a grandmother, I believe so much that this, this right is important for us to fight for, and we will fight for it. Um, you know, you saw women step up and stand up after the 2016 election, and you're going to see us do it again. Um, we will not take this sitting down. We're going to make changes in state legislatures that make sure that we can um, protect this right. And it, it in many ways will become a, a, a cry from all of us that we will join together arm in arm and fight this in any way we have to. Yeah, these are going to continue to be growing issues. More will pop up as well as growing issues as we head into the 2022 uh, midterm election season at the end, uh, near the end of this year and certainly through the next year as we get those results. And those results will have an impact on not only abortion and election rights as well as uh, on uh, the state of Mi and other Michigan issues, but on federal issues as well. Uh, LaFora Barnes, chair of the Michigan Democratic Party, we appreciate your time. Thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you. Good to see you as well. For more information on the Michigan Democratic Party, their stance on a number of different issues, or for uh, or to get in contact with uh, LaVora Barnes for more questions, go to michigandems.com. We're going to take a break. On the other side of the break, we'll shift gears from political issues to issues that affect you and I at home and in our pocketbooks as well. As people right now, with a lot of different donation drives going on, whether it be for cancer research during Breast Cancer Awareness Month, whether whether it be for hurricane relief after Ida and other storms that are popping up, or for relief for those that are affected by the, the United States Army's exit, Armed Forces exit from Afghanistan. A lot of those well-hearted and good-natured drives also are countered by a lot of scam artists. We'll speak with Melanie Ducanel from the Michigan Better Business Bureau after the break to talk about how you can avoid those scams and how you can check different boxes to assure that charities and charitable do uh, donation drives that you are in, uh, that you are uh, giving your money to are legitimate. That's coming up uh, after the break and then at the bottom of the hour we'll be joined by Oakland County Prosecutor Karen McDonald. Those two next. You're watching and listening to the Megacast. When times get dark, we can't see the help that's all around us. When you don't know where to turn, let 211 be your guiding light. Two one one, how can I help you? Our guides are ready to connect you with the help you need.
for help with food, health care, mental health, and other resources. Call 211 or visit 211.org. 211. Get connected. Get help. How does marijuana affect the teen brain? Our brains are still developing into our 20s. With regular use, marijuana can affect teen brain development. It can affect our brain's circuitry and blood flow and impair thinking, learning, and memory function. Which could hold us back from reaching our potential. Don't let marijuana mess with your brain. Get the facts at michigan.gov slash drug free. As we continue through time, as we continue through this crisis of ours, more people are in need of additional help from the generosity of others, whether it be organizations and nonprofits that are directly going out and helping these people or through other crowdfunding sources as well. But that also opens the door for people that are wanting and seeking to commit crimes of opportunity and take advantage of the kindness and the good, and the good nature of others. And one person that is on the front lines working to help people avoid those situations and be able to use their generosity and their good heart uh, for legitimate purposes is Melanie Ducanel. She is the president and CEO of the Better Business Bureau of Michigan. Joining us now on the Megacast, Melanie, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me, Tyler. So right now, after a disaster such as Hurricane Ida or the continuing pandemic, we often see a lot of these advertisements, uh, these public service announcements saying, hey, we need donations for this organization or this or that organization or uh, pandemic relief telethon pops up or, so, or something like that. Or, and there's other donation drives as well, whether it be for supplies or, so, or some other uh, supplies, monetary donations, food, whatever the case may be. But with that comes opportunities also for scammers to take advantage of people's generosity. What do we typically see? What usually is the timeline from when we start to have these calls for relief and calls for, for the generosity of others to help other people and then have these scammers also come into play? Wow, those are a lot of questions. So Tyler, I'll try to start from the beginning. The time that scammers start asking for uh, donations is usually within a couple of hours of the disaster happening. I mean, they're really quick to, to act and that's the difficulty. But there are so many things you can do to protect your money. And I'm gonna use the Humphreys Ten County, Tennessee example. The CEO of the BBB in Tennessee reached out to us directly. We know her, we know what's going on. She has boots on the ground. Those are all three great things. You need to know who's asking. You need to know how they are involved. And then you need to know if that charity has actually got boots on the ground. Now. There are people that are just like, hey, I just want to give the money and step away. And that's great if, one, you know who you're giving to. If you don't know who you're giving to because it popped up in your Facebook feed or you got a text message or something like that, that's when you have to really slow down, take a look and do a little homework. And where should people go, whether it be websites or, or numbers they can call? Obviously, the Better Business Bureau would be a resource that can provide some help on determining the legitimacy of a, of a business and, and maybe be able to point them in the right direction for some of these nonprofits as well. But are there other resources that people can access that the Better Business Bureau would suggest to take those steps to verify these, uh, these charities that they're looking into or that they're seeing sure. advertisements for? There's quite a few places, and one of them is our sister organization called Give.org. It's part of our Wise Giving Alliance organization, and they actually accredit charities. They go through and they look at their standards of trust and make sure that those charities abide in those. There's also a very other, uh, very active um, resource, and that's our state's attorney general's office. Charities in the state of Michigan need to register with the state. Now, 40 out of 50 of our states have their charities register. So depending upon where your charity is located, you could go to that attorney general's office website and see if they've been registered. 
The other thing that you can look at is Charity Navigator. They also look at their financial statements and those kind of things to make sure that they're a legitimate business. Last but not least, you can also look at the IRS's website. They will tell you if it is a registered uh, tax paying, or not really always tax paying, but a registered organization with the federal government. So there's lots of quick resources you can do. It's all done on the internet. So here's my beware statement. Don't use what is provided to you for a URL. You do all the typing yourself. Don't just take something and, and copy and paste into your web browser. You actually do. So AmericanRedCross.org. If you got a link that said AmericanRedCross.com, that's probably not American Red Cross. So you need to know exactly what you're working with. We're joined by Melanie Ducanel. She is the president and CEO of the Michigan Better Business Bureau with us on the Megacast. And, and Melanie, when people are finding these charitable organizations, you, you've identified some points they should look for to identify a legitimacy, but are there other red flags that they could be seeing as well, whether it be a boots on the ground organization that's approaching them uh, at, at you know, the grocery store or in some other public place, or it be something online, whether it be an email or it be a link, what are some red flags that people should look out for that when they see, they immediately should take a step back and be like, oh, whoa, this organization that looked like it was doing wonderful things and it's a legitimate charity and it's actually helping a lot of people may not be everything it seems to be. So the first clue is that they guarantee 100% of your donation is going to go to the victims. I don't know of any organization that does not have overhead. They have to pay staff. They have to pay for um, vehicles to transport the goods to the disaster. They have to pay for gasoline. They have to pay for storage. So there are administrative costs that actually will eat into every donation some way, somehow. The only example that is different from that is if for whatever reason, there's a benefactor that just covers all of the organization's operational costs. But that example is so few and far between. So if they say 100% of your donation is going to go to the relief efforts, beware. Another thing is, how are your donations going to be used? And if they're kind of pussyfooting around going, well, it's going to go, it's going to do that, beware. So, and then always use uh, the one that really kind of irks me is we've heard it in other shop, online shopping scams, but some of these scammers are using celebrities mm -hmm. to drive donations. Do yourself a favor, Google that celebrity's name and charity and see what they actually support. Because at the end of the day, there's a real strong chance they're not supporting this type of relief effort for this particular charity. We're joined by Melanie Ducanel. She is the president and CEO of the Michigan Better Business Bureau. Now, Melanie, some organizations may go through, may jump through all the hoops that they need to, go through all the steps that they have to to become legitimate organizations, but that doesn't necessarily mean that all of the work that they're doing is like you said, 100% is a red flag, but it's right. going majority toward the actual cause. Sometimes these nonprofits are, are using some of those funds for other means. Is that something that they have to be transparent with to potential donors, or is that something that they can uh, relieve themselves from disclosing as long as they are running their operation within the law? It really depends on the ethics of that organization of whether or not they want to be 100% transparent. It is not an it is not a legal requirement. So what you can do is you can look at the financial statements. So as an example with Charity Navigator, they will print out the financial statements of that organization. So you could quickly look and see how much is going to payroll, how much is going to building, how much is going to programming. And I do want to give you one cautionary point, though, is that if you see an organization that is 100% human driven, meaning the way that the services and the programs are delivered is by humans, you're going to see a salary number that may throw you off base. You may say, hey, wait a minute, 70% of their overall revenue source is going to salaries. That's crazy. But if it's hands and boots on the ground that they need to deliver the, the services that way, 
your payroll is going to be high. So just because payroll is high doesn't mean it's bad, but you have to know exactly what they are providing. Now, if they are just a logistics company, um, as an example, there is a nonprofit that flies um, patients out of remote areas, such as up in Alaska, to the hospital and stuff like that, and it's a charity. All the, you know, if you look at their expenses, a lot of it goes to airplane fuel. It goes to airplane maintenance. It goes to personnel cost. But if you're going, but how's that the program? That is entirely the program. We're joined by Melanie Ducanow. She is the president and the CEO of the Michigan Better Business Bureau. Joining us today on the MegaCast. And Melanie, for, for those that do end up falling victim to some of these more predatory charity scams or, or to organizations that are more predatory than than helpful and maybe predatory is the, the, a bad um, choice of words for them but maybe they're not they're leading people on more than they are leading people to help are there protections in place for general consumers and and for donors to ensure that if they do fall victim they have some help in place to either help them uh, relieve their information from from distribution or to maybe relieve uh, re to relinquish some of the funds that ha have been put out there and maybe gone to purposes that they didn't think that it was going towards potentially and I, I use that in quotations potentially if you use a credit card to make your payment and you can prove that the money did not go to charitable um, outcome you could talk to your credit card company and get a refund the other resource and the strongest one, but the problem is, is that it's going to take a long time to potentially get a refund, is the uh, state's attorney general, Dana Nessel's office. They do have a charitable organization task force and team that watches our charities in the state very closely. If this charity is out of state, again, you can go to the state attorney general. The other thing that you can also look at is the Federal Trade Commission, because depending upon how they solicited you, that could also be something that they could advocate on your behalf. So, but sadly, if you generally give a donation, the donation is gone. So that's why the upfront homework is so important. We're joined by Melanie Ducanel. She's the president and the CEO of the Better Business Bureau of Michigan with us today on the, on the MegaCast. And uh, Melanie, not all charities are created the same. Uh, a lot of people will make donations to a, a cause that they uh, find near and dear to their heart or something that is, that is um, uh, tugging at their heartstrings at one moment in time. They may make a donation and think, well, A, this organization, I've done my research, I've done my homework, they're doing good work, I want to help and make a donation, and the benefit for me is I can deduct that from my taxes later on. But that's not the case with every single charity, correct? That's correct, especially, and this is probably the one that pulls at your heartstrings the most. A family loses their house to a fire and they do a crowdfunding site. And so everybody wants to make a donation to that family. 99% of the time, the family has not created a charity in order to receive those funds. So that will not be tax deductible. So again, one of those other upfront questions, are you a 501c3 charity? If you understand that designation, that's an IRS determinant. And when you have that available, they the charity should be able to give you a receipt if it is fully tax deductible. We're joined by Melanie Ducanel. She is the president and CEO of the Michigan Better Business Bureau. Joining us today on the MegaCast. Melanie, just another couple minutes with you before we'll say goodbye sure. today. Uh, is there anything else right now that is of great concern or should be of concern to consumers in a general sense across the board, uh, whether it be related to charities and to charity scams or to other issues that the Better Business Bureau is working on? So we're just coming into what I consider the tidy up and button up season known as fall and winter before we all go back and hibernate in our houses. So we're all looking at roofing and waterproofing and all those kind of things. So home improvement scams are still out there. So you have to be careful. And again, I know I say this word too many times, but homework is imperative. So know exactly what you want to get done and what your budget is in advance of having anybody come and give you a quote you may be completely surprised you know because of the availability of contractors right now being so few and far between as an example i'm looking at tuck pointing my chimney before winter and i asked i talked to him at the beginning of july i'm going to see him in october 
So if you're going to do these things, you really need to do your homework and get that contract signed now because you're going to find that they're booking so far in advance that you might not actually get it done in 2021. I'm joined by Melanie Ducanel. She is the president and the CEO of the Michigan Better Business Bureau with us today on the Megacast. Melanie, before we let you go, uh, what are some important links that are provided through the Better Business Bureau that pe or, or web pages through the Better Business Bureau that you would suggest people view before they make donations or before they make business, decision, business decisions for some of those fall tidying up procedures they want to go Sure. For? You can always go to bbb.org and for our local area, it's slash Detroit because the Better Business Bureau covers all of North America, including Canada and Mexico. So we are trying to protect you everywhere you go on our continent. But if you're specifically looking for tips on what to do for home improvement or for charity, we do have a search button, just type in that, or look at our news and events column as well. We can also show you what our tips are. But the most interesting part of what we do is we have a uh, website called BBB Scam Tracker, and you can actually look by zip code on what kind of scams and frauds are going on in your area. And if, as an example, my family lives in um, Nevada as well, so if I'm looking to do something on behalf of my parents, I can look specifically at Nevada's zip code and see if there's anything in particular that they need to be wary of, and I can alert them as well. Well, Melanie, we appreciate having you on. Thank you for all this very helpful information, especially as people respond to Hurricane Ida, the situation with the evacuation of troops from Afghanistan and other issues that will pop up uh, and, and charitable opportunities. It's important for people to know this information. And as they go into the fall and make those home improvements and other, and other changes in their life as well and uh, interact with some local businesses, hopefully legitimate ones. And if not, they'll have the tools they need to figure out how to combat that before or even after they are in a, in a precarious situation. So thank you for the information. Thanks, Tyler. Appreciate being here. I couldn't breathe at all. There was lots of talk about putting me on a ventilator. I thought I was going to die. I was 39 weeks pregnant and had a scheduled C-section. During that time, I got COVID and was hospitalized for a month. I had a blood clot in my lungs. It caused me to go into right-sided heart failure. I was really scared. I kept texting my husband and my mom, telling them how scared I was, and I was worried that he was gonna grow up without a mom. And then I was worried if, when I did get home, that he wouldn't know who I was. You know, being 27 and a mom and a wife and having that all almost taken away from me. It's scary, and if a vaccine can prevent that from happening, why not get your vaccine? I don't want this to happen to anybody else. A message from the staff of Michigan's Crime Victim Compensation Program. Anyone can be a victim of crime. And suffer lasting trauma, physically, emotionally, and financially. But you are not alone. If you're struggling financially due to a crime, we're here for you. Find out if you qualify for crime victim compensation. Call 877-251-7373 or visit michigan.gov slash crime victim. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, Division of Victim Services. Welcome back to the Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe, alongside board operator and studio producer Calvin Brown. You're listening to us on your radio home for the Megacast, 89.3 WBLD Orchard Lake and 88.1 WBFH Bloomfield Hills. Learn more about each of our partnering radio stations, as well as our TV and the media out and uh, web media outlets, as well on our website, civiccentertv.com slash megacast. To, cap off, to kick off the second hour of the show, we're pleased to be joined by Oakland County Prosecutor Karen McDonald with us now on the program. Karen, thanks for being with us today. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, glad to have you on. Let's start off by talking about um, a, a case that's um, becoming more important to your office as of late. That's the case of Juwan Deering. Now, in, uh, August, I'm sorry, in April of 2000, five children died in a house fire in Royal Oak Township. Um, and then six years later, uh, Mr. Deering was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. And that sentence was, uh, and that conviction was largely based on 
the uh, testimony of three jailhouse informants. However, uh, over the years, it's been found uh, not only by your office, but by others that have contacted your office about this case, that some of those informant testimonies were not quite legitimate or had some has had some faults to them. Can you discuss a little bit about why this case is being reconsidered and where it's at right now? Sure. Uh, it, it came to my attention because the Innocence Clinic asked us to take a look at it um, only solely regarding the arson science. Um, as, as many of the listeners may know, the um, arson science has changed over the past 20, 30 years. And um, what, what we traditionally relied on is no longer uh, credible. Um, so in the process of doing that, um, a couple prosecutors who had, our career prosecutors that have been in the office for a very long time came to see me and said, we actually have some concerns about this case and we always have. So I just pulled the file, um, the actual file, which is, consists of three or four um, boxes of documents and immediately uh, saw a, um, a letter written by one of the informants to the, the prosecutor at the time um, indicating that there was some sort of agreement about a deal he would get for, for testifying. And that, of course, is alarming because jailhouse informants are used and, and they're allowable. You just have to always disclose to the jury what, if anything, they received for their cooperation and their testimony. And uh, I quickly realized that none of that was ever even disclosed or brought up in the trial. Um, I immediately called the Innocence Clinic and said, do you know about this letter? And that led to a, a, a long investigation, which started with me ordering all of our files that we had charged any of those three informants to see if there were other deals. It's really important here to, to understand the only way you, anybody could would discover that these informants were given deals or leniency for their cooperation and testimony is by looking at the, the private confidential files of the prosecutor. Um, notes that we as uh, trial lawyers write in the, in the folder, internal memos. Um, and it was clear to me that, that that had taken place. In fact, in one, in one case, the informant had been used for over 20 years with the Sheriff's Department. Uh, so I requested and was granted um, permission to hire an independent prosecutor, was completely transparent and, and uh, uh, turned it all over to the, um, Mr. Deering's lawyers as well as the public. And uh, the Michigan State Police aided in doing an independent investigation. The prosecutor, the independent prosecutor, Beth Morrow, just released her recommendation, which was that we vacate Mr. Deering's conviction. And based on all of the findings, I, I, I agree with that based on everything that was discovered. We're joined by Karen McDonald. She's the Oakland County prosecutor with us on the Megacast. And uh, prosecutor, when something, when, when information like was received in Mr. Deering's case is brought to the prosecutor's office's uh, attention or uh, to some other office, uh, higher offices' attention, where does that process start to then review that case? Is it a situation where you're immediately starting with, okay, maybe we, we need to reconsider this person's conviction, or maybe we want to vacate their sentence? Where does that process generally start for people that may have cases that have some questionable outcomes or questionable evidence or questionable processes, and how do they go about addressing that with their prosecutor, such as your office? Well, there's two lines here. Um, the first route is the traditional route of your um, appeals court. Uh, you have a, a right to appeal in the Michigan Court of Appeals, and then um, you, if the Michigan Supreme Court grants leave, then they will hear your case. Uh, the other is through what we uh, call a conviction integrity unit. And that these are um, units designated in prosecutor's office solely to revisit cases where new information and evidence has come to light. It is not to stand in the place of the jury. It is to um, address cases where, for instance, that the science used 20 years ago has now um, been uh, improved or DNA evidence has come to light or, or new evidence that the jury didn't hear. Uh, 
I mean, that is in the works. I've requested that from the Board of Commissioners and the County Executive Dave Coulter uh, actually in incorporated that in his budget proposal. So we hope to be up and running on that um, in October. However, uh, this is a little different because this involves misconduct. And um, it's not just finding out new information. It's, it's discovering that there was prosecutorial misconduct and um, as well as we, we later discovered that there was a, a second part of an interview done of the only living child from the fire just days after the fire that was never turned over to even our office, which included a photo ID lineup where the child looked at a picture of Mr. Deering, what we can tell, and said it wasn't him, which is a, a pretty big deal that, that our office didn't know about and the defendant didn't know about. So this is a little, uh, I think, exceptional. The I think your average conviction integrity unit reviews hundreds of cases and only um, recommends relief granted on few of them. And that can come to our unit through an attorney, but also straight from um, an individual who's been convicted and is incarcerated. We're joined by Karen McDonald, the Oakland County prosecutor, with us on the megacast today. And uh, Prosecutor McDonald, uh, uh, shifting gears a little bit, um, it, we, we've heard a lot recently about, um, there's been a lot of debate recent, recently, especially since the uh, Michigan marijuana laws were, were changed and, and that marijuana was decriminalized in the state of Michigan, although it's still federally Ill illegal, that should be of note. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about reconsidering some cases of those that have been imprisoned or convicted of marijuana charges. Uh, and, and locally, in, in September 1st, um, Rudy Gamo's case, uh, his, his attorneys had gathered uh, to call for an immediate release and dropping of all charges against him related to uh, 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 marijuana related charges that were against him. Your office had even said that you believe that uh, the prison time that he has served already more than fits his crime and his attorney and the uh, defendant's notes uh, says in his brief that the conduct for which the defendant was incarcerated has been decriminalized and because of that his case should be reconsidered. From your office's perspective now that Michigan does have has decriminalized uh, marijuana what both the sale and possession of, of marijuana with some uh, other uh, stipulations in place. What is your office doing or what, what's your office's approach to considering some of these people that are uh, in prison as a result of cases here in Oakland County to either maybe reconsider their charges or reconsider their their convictions or maybe vacate sentences uh, because we now have a different paradigm in the state of Michigan regarding marijuana? We do and uh, we also have a new prosecutor and you know, I, I ran on a platform of common sense criminal justice reform, um, which which is that our first priority is public safety, um, but we need to do what works and what makes sense and what protects all people. And keeping somebody in prison for an offense that is no longer considered illegal um, at a great expense to the taxpayer doesn't make sense if uh, so long as this person doesn't pose a threat to the public. In in Mr. Gamble's case, we it was brought to us. Uh, we reviewed it. I reviewed it personally, and we we agreed. We stipulated that it should be um, that that he should be released. However, uh, in a rare turn of events, the judge did not agree, which is somewhat unusual because when you have a prosecutor who agrees and a defendant um, who agrees, you know, I, I'm actually a former circuit court judge, and that's. That's a that's a pretty much a home run, uh, but in this case, the judge did not agree, and um, I, I can't speak for the judge. We're joined by Oakland County Prosecutor Karen McDonald on the mega cask. Uh, Karen's in her first term as the prosecutor here in Oakland County, and uh, Prosecutor McDonald over the past year and a half, especially uh, given uh, the protests and a lot of the discussions that were initiated in the wake of the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis as well as hate crimes against pe uh, people in the Asian American Pacific Islander community in Florida. There's been a lot of discussion and focus across the U.S. but also here in Michigan on addressing hate crimes and particularly here in Oakland County where we have such a wide variety of diverse populations. What is your office, in partnership with other organizations such as the sheriff's office, local police departments, and so and the state police, uh, and, and other organizations as well? What what are you doing to address 
the issue of hate crimes, not only prevention, but also addressing them in, in, in the form of prosecution here in Oakland County. So we created a hate crimes unit, which is a dedicated prosecutor that reviews those cases from the charging decision and then uh, vertically prosecutes that all the way through the system. As part of that, she has received uh, expert training uh, with the cooperation and help from the Attorney General's office um, and other agencies and resources. We've also partnered with FAIR Michigan that helps us uh, identify and work with and um, advocate advocate for uh, members of the LGBTQ community, and also doing outreach to local law enforcement agencies to really educate law enforcement on what what's a hate crime, what can we prosecute, what do we need to prosecute it. A lot of these things occur and they don't show up as hate crimes because that's not really a word that is a typical law enforcement word um, that it but it could be you know any kind of assault of crime it could be um, property destruction so you know I, I to be to be very candid those cases aren't easy to prosecute and I'm hoping that the Michigan legislature will will take a look at those um, statutes to, to to make it a little easier uh, to to prosecute when we know that it was um, out of somebody's prejudice against somebody's um, ethnicity or um, background, but they aren't easy to prosecute. So it takes some specialized training, both with the prosecutor's office and local law enforcement agencies. We're joined by Oakland County Prosecutor Karen McDonald with us on the Megacast today. And uh, Prosecutor McDonald, in your previous position as an assistant prosecutor for five years, um, you long were an advocate for children, particularly um, though, uh, in prosecuting children who were victims, uh, prosecuting the perpetrators of child sex crimes here in, in Oakland County. What's being done at the prosecutor level today to continue to, to battle against that issue here in Oakland County, but also the ongoing and continuously growing issue of human trafficking, not only in the state of Michigan, but throughout uh, the U.S. that definitely affects o the Oakland County area as well? So one of the first things we did in the first 90 days uh, is create a a trafficking unit, which was formerly called the drug unit, it, it now is a trafficking unit. And we have prosecutors in that unit that um, specialize in prosecuting both the trafficking of narcotics, narcotics, but also human trafficking, which, again, really um, is it's critical for those individuals to get specialized training. We have some really good law enforcement agencies in this county that have already uh, done that training and are very adept at investigating and and prosecuting human trafficking. Um, Madison Heights was the first agency we partnered with, and um, uh, you know I'm I'm really proud of the work the people in my office uh, did and and are doing, as well as the 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 police department in Madison Heights. So that is, I I well I know it's the first uh, specialized unit that deals with human trafficking um, in this office, but I think I think one of the very, very few in the entire state, um, if not the country. So with regard to child victims, we, we have had and still have a special victims unit where we focus solely on prosecuting victims of uh, child sexual assault, uh, sex assault, and domestic violence. And also, what people I think forget about is the prosecutor's office also has a juvenile division, and in that division, we uh, we proceed on petitions to remove children or temporary petitions uh, for abuse and neglect, where we can really identify vulnerable kids that um, are have a really increased chance of becoming part of the criminal justice system later. Uh, we also prosecute and proceed on juvenile delinquent matters. So. Uh, I, I absolutely um, agree and appreciate you um, commenting on my lifelong advocacy for children. I started out as a public uh, high school teacher and then um, was in the prosecutor's office prosecuting child sexual assault cases and then uh, was in private practice in family law where I dealt with, with kids and families as well and then sat on the circuit court bench in Oakland County as a family court judge. 
And let's continue on the, on, on the uh, juvenile uh, discussion. Uh, we're joined by Prosecutor Karen McDonald with us on the MegaCast, the Oakland County Prosecutor. And while you were running for office, you did make a point of wanting to address reforming the juvenile delinquent system uh, here in Oakland County or, re or refocusing on it to make it a system that is more conducive to prevention of crime amongst children and, and preventing the recidivism of children back into the system after they have gone through what, whatever the means may be to either um, properly address whatever crimes they may or may not have committed and to, and to prevent them from coming back into the system later on. Also re reforming certain programs and reimagining certain programs like the Children's Village program here in Oakland County. What has been done since you have entered office by your team at the prosecutor's office to begin to address those issues and what are some changes that maybe the, the public maybe isn't aware of or isn't seeing uh, but are definitely making some changes in the lives of children that are unfortunately uh, in the system in one way or another? Well, first, I, I'm I'm happy to announce that I've recently been appointed by the governor to the the, the task force that's newly created, um, fo solely focusing on juvenile justice reform. I'm very excited about that. We have resources um, both in this county and in the state, and grant funding for innovative uh, programming that really addresses the problem. Um, in the juvenile system, uh, charging kids with crimes. Um, is necessary at times, there's no question. But we also have to understand that in very, very often, those, those kids are, are being charged for, for a wrongful act, but they are also usually victims from other some sort of abuse or neglect. And because of that, we can't just treat them like many adults. What we know from the data is that um, a child that has been removed from a home, even just for one day, um, has an increased likelihood by seven times of encountering um, homelessness, drug addiction, substance abuse, um, incarceration, uh, uh, suicide. There's just, so what, what do we really, what do we wanna prevent? Well, what, what we wanna prevent is kids being vulnerable to any of those things and also being charged with a crime. And so the abuse and neglect area that the prosecutor's office leads in terms of filing petition, we need to spend more time and focus on that. And traditionally, I think that division has not been um, as emphasized as it should in the past. And that is a priority to me. Um, why? Because a, you know, I really care about kids and every and every person. But b, it's so it, it's common sense. Don't we want to make our community safer by putting focus and resources into children who we know are very likely um, going to become victims or charged with crimes as adults? That just makes sense to me as as a prosecutor, as a lawyer, as a mom. Uh, that's what I think we should be focusing on. So. I have uh, spent a lot more time focused on that division and really empowering my um, assistant prosecutors to explore these uh, more modern approaches to how we view children in the criminal justice system. And that involves treatment court, that involves these crossover cases where we both have uh, a child who's been removed or is in a home where there's a petition filed and is also charged with a crime and working together to, to find a solution that doesn't end with this child being uh, detained um, or proper resources and programming to address the issues. So um, it's, it's, a, it's really stunning to me that more time and energy and focus has not been put on the abuse and neglect docket of those, the, those kids who are in those cases because that is really, um, that's the epitome of going upstream and saying, what's the problem? How can we fix it? We're joined by Karen McDonald, the Oakland County prosecutor with us on the Megacast. And uh, prosecutor, just another couple of minutes with you before we'll say goodbye today. Is there anything else uh, that's currently being addressed by the prosecutor's office that we maybe haven't spoken about today or something that would be interesting or important for our audience to know about the work that's being done by your office at this time? We, we've accomplished a great deal in nine months. Um, I, I pledged in my campaign to, 
to address the racial disparity that exists in, in our criminal justice system. We have partnered with the University of Michigan so that we can collect data uh, so we know who we're charging and what we're charging them with. Um, I've given discretion for the first time in, in the county for many, many years to assistant prosecutors who are seasoned trial attorneys to make decisions about what makes sense for their uh, cases and for the victims that they're advocating for. Um, and that is something that hasn't been done before, but is important because when you're when you're the prosecutor, who has is dealing with the case and you you have all of the information sometimes the right solution is not always the the one that you traditionally take it uh, so i've given permission and i really emphasize this idea of looking at an individual case and doing what makes sense um, for victims of of crime and for uh the defendant and looking to an eye of how can we prevent this from happening again and and by that i mean when we we know we have crimes that were instigated out of um, a mental health issue or a substance abuse issue incarcerating for you know a, a short period of time and never addressing those issues um, is very expensive but also it makes us less safe um, so that area of the the non-violent crimes where where we really need to address um mental health issues, substance abuse issues, I, I'm really focusing on because I think I think that's what the county deserves. And ultimately, public safety um, and crime prevention has a number of different roots and a number of different impacts that go into not only preventing those crimes, but addressing them and preventing them from happening again in the future or being exacerbated down the line. So we appreciate your insight, appreciate you giving us some information about your office's approach. Uh, of course, when uh, when leadership changes, it's important to understand how that leadership's changed because approaches change as well and that impacts our community. So, Prosecutor, we appreciate your time. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Appreciate it. Oakland County Prosecutor Karen McDonald with us today on the Megacast. We're going to take a quick break. On the other side, we're going to be joined by Gina Kel Spain. She is the co founder and president of the New Day Foundation for Families Fighting Cancer. Their mission is to provide prevent financial and emotional support for families that are fighting cancer and they have some upcoming fundraisers including an event coming up at a local high school football game that will be coming up this week as well. We'll talk to Gina about that and more about the organization next. You're watching and listening to the Megacast. You see certain things get reincarnated in your children. My daughter is very much inspired by my wife's artistic pursuits. So my daughter started making necklaces. She makes what we call affirmation fashion. I tell her every day that your black is beautiful. Your black is beautiful. Your black is beautiful. And if there's anything better than being beautiful, it's being smart. And if there's anything better than being smart, it's being kind. And reaffirming that every day is our method of making sure her chin never drops. My dad wasn't around. And I remember riding a bike and falling off and cutting myself. And me never would just wanted to get back on it. People ask, how your children learn how to ride a bike? And you did. I didn't teach them. I just created an environment where they taught themselves. And all I had to do was be there. Who is struggling right now? I am. My son is. Many are struggling with anxiety, depression, and substance use. Before it becomes a crisis, reach out to MyCal, the Michigan Crisis and Access Line for free confidential support 24-7. Available in the Upper Peninsula in Oakland County. Just call or text 1-844-44-MyCal or chat online at michigan.gov slash MyCal. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. I couldn't breathe at all. There was lots of talk about putting me on a ventilator. I thought I was gonna die. I was 39 weeks pregnant and had a scheduled C-section. During that time, I got COVID and was hospitalized for a month. I had a blood clot in my lungs. It caused me to go into right-sided heart failure. I was really scared. I kept texting my husband and my mom, telling them how scared I was and I was worried that he was gonna grow up without a mom. And then I was worried if when I did get home that he wouldn't know who I was. You know, being 27 and a mom and a wife and 
having that all almost taken away from me. It's scary, and if a vaccine can prevent that from happening, why not? Get your vaccine. I don't want this to happen to anybody else. Welcome back to the Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith in our studios here in West Bloomfield Township. We're pleased to be joined now by Gina Kell Spain. She is the founder, the co-founder and the president of the New Day Foundation for Families Fighting Cancer. Joining us on the Megacast, Gina, thanks for being with us today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So there are a lot of different organizations and nonprofits, not only in Michigan, but throughout the, the region, throughout the U.S., that are addressing the issue of cancer, whether it be a specific form of cancer or just cancer research and cancer awareness uh, in general. What does your organization do? Maybe that's, that's uh, definitely that's different from some of these other organizations and maybe some similarities as well. Yeah, well, we provide a lot of non-medical resources, so we're not focused on research as an organization, but what we are focused on is people. Um, we work with families who face any type of cancer, regardless of whether it's an adult or a child in treatment, but our criteria is that the family member has to be in active treatment. They have to have children in their home under the age of 18 or a dependent. Uh, sometimes there's college age students that are, uh, that families that qualify with college age students as well. And um, they must be able to demonstrate some type of income loss or financial distress in order to re receive financial assistance. For a couple of other programs that we have, like grocery assistance and emotional support, you don't have to have children living in your home or dependent children, but you do have to have someone in your family in active treatment. We're joined by Gina Kell Spain. She is the co-founder and the president of the New Day Foundation for Families Fighting Cancer with us on the Megacast. And Gina, how do families uh, address these these issues and get the help from your organization because I would imagine that it's already a tough enough process for a lot of these families just to deal with the medical situation as it is but on top of that having to navigate the financial side of things as well dealing with the hospitals dealing with their medical with their medical providers with insurance and, and if that's even a consideration in some cases it's not and they might not even know or have the means to research an organization like yours how do they go about or how does your organization go about finding these families that are in such financial need of assistance so that they can address the cancer issue but also not create a new issue after they do hopefully ultimately survive their bout with cancer? Yeah, that's a great question because it's one of the biggest barriers for us is getting access to the patients who have the greatest need. So first and foremost, we have relationships with more than 50 hospitals across the state of Michigan. So those 50 hospitals are the front line for New Day. They're social work teams primarily, but additionally nurse practitioners, oncology social workers, doctors, you name it, um, anybody can be a referring um, healthcare provider. So those people have access to New Day. We do our very best to educate as many people within the hospital system about what we're doing and who we are. So we have pretty great relationships with about 50 of them at this point, but there's other ways to get a hold of us. There's other ways to learn about us. Um, for those who have the means to go online and access um, the internet and research, you can find us just by searching for foundationforfamilies.org. That's one easy way to do it. Um, but it's also like opportunities like this, talking to you today, um, getting the word out, helping people know that these resources are available to you and that you're not alone when you're going through this. So many families really truly feel um, ashamed in some cases when it comes to financial difficulties. Um, there's a lot of people who feel like they're always the ones who are giving back and so they don't want to ask for help, but just being aware and knowing that it's private, it's confidential, and we're not sharing your information with anyone. You have access to us in a number of ways, um, and but primarily through the, on the front line through the hospital. But we know that they're overworked, and um, oftentimes it's hard to find us that way. So thank you for having us because it really means a lot to get the word out. 
Absolutely. We're joined by Gina Kel Spain. She is the co-founder and the president of the New Day Foundation for Families Fighting Cancer. Find more inf information about their efforts at foundationforfamilies.org as well as information about how you can get in contact with them if your family or a loved one or someone else that you know uh, is battling cancer or has someone in their life battling cancer and may need this critical assistance from organizations like Gina's. And uh, Gina, you have a, a couple of upcoming events that will help to additionally support the cause and, and provide some fundraising, hopefully, as well uh, for everything that your organization does. Tell us a little bit about what people can expect uh, when they go to a, a fundraiser under the lights on Friday night at Stony Creek High School as they take on the Clarkston Wolves in a, and also hold a fundraiser for a good cause uh, during that community tradition. Yeah, I'm, we're so grateful to Coach Nick Merlo and his entire team. They're just such a great group of guys. Coach Merlo makes sure that his team understands what they're competing for, that as important as the game is on Friday night, that what's more important is the game of life and, and caring for one another and supporting our fellow neighbor. So there are um, a couple of the players on the team have each lost a parent to cancer. So there's some, you know, actual um, personal connection here. The team also had a young, um, a young boy who was at Hart Middle School, and he was also battling cancer. So they're also kind of playing in his memory as well. But the, the night's all about families affected by cancer and how we can join together as a community, rally around an awesome game of football to support um, our fellow neighbor who's going through this horrible time and, and hopefully we can bring them a little bit of help and a little bit of hope. We're joined by Gina Kel Spain. She is the co-founder and the president of the New Day Foundation for Families Fighting Cancer, joining us on the Megacast. And you also have a new series uh, that's going on that's being joined by uh, former Channel 7 and Channel 4 uh, weather reporter Kim Adams, uh, who most recently was a radio host on 98.7 FM about uh, conversations about useful information and, and dealing with the difficult situations that come with dealing with cancer, either for yourself or for a loved one or someone else that's important to you in life. How do people access these virtual workshops? What goes into each one of them? And why ultimately did your organization choose to go with Kim Adams to be the moderator and the leader of these discussions? Well, I can start by telling you that Kim Adams is a true champion for the mission of New Day. She's someone who's battled breast cancer herself. Um, her story is a really powerful one, and she talks about how when she was in her hour of need, she actually resisted accepting help, and she realized after the fact how much it could have helped her and her family and really saved them a lot of time, um, helped her to heal faster, and ultimately, you know, the benefits of what she didn't receive, how, how it could have actually helped her. So she's, she's a huge champion for the cause, and she is on our advisory board now, and she represents us through these um, virtual workshops, interviewing different sometimes physicians, sometimes local banks, helping people understand about financial literacy or about their health care in general. Um, she has some interesting conversations with some famous people from um, uh, out, out in Hollywood. So you'll have to check them out. All of them are available for viewing on our website at foundationforfamilies.org. And also, speaking of uh, celebrities and some fun things going on, you also have in October at the Fillmore uh, in Detroit, you have an upcoming lip sync battle. It's going to feature a lot of celebrity performers like Joanne Purton from WOMC and uh, formerly from Channel 7 News here uh, mm -hmm. here locally. Also, Brooke Fletcher, who you see regularly on Bally Sports. Another person that you used to see regularly on Bally Sports when it was Fox Sports Detroit, former Detroit Tiger outfielder uh, and star Andy Dirks, will be among the performers at this event. When uh, Obviously, it's October 21st at the Fillmore. How can people get tickets, and are other people able to participate in this lip sync battle? Well, first of all, absolutely. So we're, we're so, this is like our, our biggest, most important, most fun event of the year as an organization. Um, you're right, you mentioned a couple of the folks that are participating. I just found out this morning, so you're getting the scoop oh. that we're going to, I know, we're going to have Rick Mahorn and Earl Curitan, former Detroit Piston legends, participating in the event this year as well. Just found out this morning. And um, we'll have people like Mojo from Mojo in the Morning as one of our judges, and Everett Casimi from WDIV. Uh, Paul Glantz from Imagine Theater. So we, we have a few um, really great celebs lined up for this event. Um, absolutely, you can buy tickets. They will be going on sale this week. There are um, 
mezzanine level seats and balcony level seats available. And again, it's all through our website at foundationforfamilies.org. You'll click on the events link and you'll find everything you need to know about the event and all the fun that's going to be happening that night. It's like it's a Thursday night, by the way. It's a Thursday, October 21st. It's at the Fillmore in Detroit. And uh, we're super excited about it. Yeah, uh, really, yeah, it sounds like a lot of a lot of fun, and uh, I'm sure a lot of people will be excited to see Rick Mahorn uh, performing up there, one of the iconic bad boys from the Detroit Pistons 1989 championship team, and hopefully he goes up there wearing a bad boy shirt and singing one of the bad boys' anthems, Public Enemies Fight the Power, would be a great <laughs> song for Rick Mahorn. This definitely we'll should see. suggest that we'll to Rick. see if he pulls that off. <laughs> for that cool. event. So we're joined by Gina Kel Spain. She is the co-founder and the president of the New Day Foundation for Families fighting cancer with us today on the Mega Cash. Gina, just another couple minutes with you before we'll say goodbye. Is there anything else that would be important for our audience to know about your organization or anything else, uh, such as upcoming programs or events or fundraisers coming up that would be helpful for our audience to know about today? Yeah, well, thank you. Yes, um, I think it's important for people to know that when you get a cancer diagnosis, your priority is your physical health, but there are other elements to your cancer journey that are just as, as important and that when they're attended to and when you are actually thinking about your financial situation, your emotional health, when you fa factor those into your health care, it actually can have a direct impact on your treatment outcome. So we're part of the cancer solution and by helping you, it sounds silly in some cases, but by helping you just bridge the gap financially while you've lost some income, while you have that period of time when you're in between jobs or unable to work because you're going through treatment or caregiving for someone who's going through treatment. You have an organization right here in your own neighborhood who's able to support you and provide you with that safety net that you need to get through it. <clears throat> I want people to also know we don't pay, uh, we do pay bills directly to creditors, so we don't provide direct cash to anyone. Um, we, are, we, we go through a fairly rigorous um, application process as well. And all of this is for the good of the cancer community, and we're very appreciative of the business community also that partners with us. Kroger, for example, works with us to provide grocery support directly to families. Um, we work with express employment professionals when we need access to employment agency work. Um, you know, some of our biggest sponsors are also doing work on the side with us to help us to truly create that fully rounded um, safety net, like I said, was talking about earlier. So we're grateful for our community, for the people who support us, and we're honored to be able to do this work. And we appreciate the time that we have with you today to share that. I appreciate your time as well, Gina. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Learn more about the organization's efforts at foundationforfamilies.org. We've been joined by Gina Kell Spain. She is the co-founder and the president of the New Day Foundation for Families Fighting Cancer. We're going to take a break on the other side of the break. We're excited to be joined by the mayor of Southfield. One of our new partners here on the Megacast is Southfield's municipal cable television station. We'll be joined by their mayor, Ken Cyber, next on the Megacast. Motorcyclists are hard to see. To keep everyone safer, it's important to always look for them and know where most crashes occur. 84% of motorcycle and vehicle crashes happen on streets, not highways. And most crashes with motorcyclists occur when vehicle drivers are turning left. So before turning, especially to the left, make sure you look for motorcyclists. Then look again, it could save a life. Sophia and Gabriel. Even though these old knees can't follow on your adventure to the forest today, these flowers represent my love. These stitches and threads join us together. And wherever you see a flower, a bird, a beautiful tree, know that my love is with you. Make the forest part of your story at a park near you. Find one at discovertheforest.org. 
Welcome back to the MegaCast. I'm Tyler Keith, alongside studio operator and the board producer Alvin Brown with us on the MegaCast on Civic Center TV on Birmingham Area Municipal Access, 88.1 WBFH, The Bits, 89.3 Lakes FM. Online on CivicCenterTV.com and on MyMichiganTV on MyMyTV.com or MyMyTV.com as well as the MyMy app on your smartphone and the My Michigan TV app on your smart TV. We're also on Facebook, facebook.com slash civiccentertv15 and facebook.com slash lakesfm. And now, for the first time this week, we're, we're joined by Waterford Community Television and City Cable 15 out of the city of Southfield. And, and we're pleased to cap off today's show with their mayor, Mayor Ken Cyber, joins us once again from the city of Southfield. Mayor, thanks for being with us today. Glad to be here and uh, glad that the uh, network has extended to uh, the city of Southfield. Yeah, really, uh, really pleased to be joined by City Cable 15 and uh, appreciate them joining us each and every day for our live shows from 10 a.m. to 12 noon, Monday through Friday, and uh, give the good people of Southfield another way to enjoy this program and stay informed about what's happening, not only in Southfield, but also all throughout southeastern Michigan and across the Great Lakes State. Let's start well, with what's going on in Southfield right now. Ken, what are some new projects or new initiatives that have been coming up in the city since we last spoke? Well, we uh, were discussing uh, Northland uh, last time. Yes. So I'll just give a brief update on that. Um, <clears throat> the former um, Montgomery Ward Auto Service Center has been demolished. That's on Greenfield Road. Uh, and what was the um, a standalone downtown police station has uh, that also was set back from Greenfield. Uh, that has been demolished. Um, the demo uh, demolition of the uh, J.C. Penney building uh, has been delayed slightly uh, in that when the uh, state inspectors uh, came out, um, uh, they found a little more asbestos that uh, hadn't been caught. Uh, a huge amount of um, the penny, the pennies building uh, was uh, just riddled with uh, asbestos materials, uh, from floor tiles uh, to uh, all of the uh, uh, plaster, um, the, the wallboard. Uh, so all of that had been removed, but they found. Uh, some uh, mastic uh, with um, uh, asbestos containing materials. So that that has delayed the demolition, but um, uh, things are things are moving along. They're also tearing up. Uh, you know, um, anybody that has a Northland history knows that it was a sea of asphalt all around the, the shopping center. And so uh, asphalt is being removed as uh, we get ready for the groundbreaking uh, in mid-October for the first uh, uh, new mixed-use buildings. There'll be five stories uh, with retail on first floor and um, apartments in various sizes uh, above. Mayor Ken Sauber uh, joins us from the city of Southfield. Oh, please continue on, sorry for interrupting. No, I was just gonna say um, that's kind of the uh, up to the minute update on, on uh, Northland. Okay, so we're joined by Mayor Ken Cyber. He is the mayor of the city of Southfield with us today on the MegaCast. And Mayor, uh, since we last spoke, the COVID-19 situation uh, across the state, definitely here in Oakland County, has significantly changed. Oakland County now considered in the high rate of transmission of COVID-19 by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, and since we last spoke, given the COVID situation then and even the COVID situation now, we've seen some municipalities return to in-person meetings, whether it be, uh, uh, whether it be all of them or uh, in some cases it's just for example, school districts that are not affiliated with cities return to in-person meetings, but others have, have continued to have virtual municipal business being done. What is the case in the city of Southfield? Are your city meetings back in person or do they continue on virtually? We uh, had hoped that after Labor Day, we would uh, resume in-person meetings for uh, city council, all of our boards and commissions, and um, the city council in August, seeing what the, the trends were, has extended the um, electronic meetings for 
city council and all boards and commission meetings uh, through uh, the end of 2021. I have to say this is extremely frustrating. Um, uh, I continue um, to see an increase in cases in Southfield and uh, we're hearing that these uh, cases are the unvaccinated. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, um, and we, we've done everything here to encourage people to get vaccinated, including um, partnering with Open County Health Division and Ascension Health to have a vaccination clinic right at uh, the municipal building. Um, and finally, uh, had to curtail these activities because uh, we didn't have takers that um, we're well over 6,400 cases uh, in Southfield uh, since uh, March of 2020. Um, it's not something we're happy about. We're joined and, by Mayor uh, Ken Siver. He is the mayor of the city of Southfield with us today on the Megacast. And Mayor, uh, we had another storm last night. Uh, thunderstorms throughout the, the area that did take out power during the storms, at least initially, to about 150,000 people here in southeastern Michigan. A lot of crews were already put out this morning, as early as 8 a.m. this morning, by DTE to restore some of the, the power for those uh, as of the beginning of the show and when we uh, read an article that was released about 9 a.m. About 19,000 of those 150,000 had their power restored. But this is an ongoing issue we've, we've seen with severe weather taking out people's power and then there's been issues getting the power back and restored in a timely manner. And both yourself and Lathrop Village Mayor uh, Kelly Garrett launched a petition on moveon.org in an effort to put some additional pressure on DTE Energy. You were quoted saying, we understand uh, we've had some severe weather events, but at the same time, a good 40% of outages are equipment failures and closed quote. Uh, care to address what are some of the hopes or demands or issues, particularly in the city of Southfield, that are being taken up with DTE Energy and other energy providers on this issue at this current time? And has any progress been made in any discussions from the city to these providers about addressing these issues? Well, thank you for bringing that up because it's been extremely frustrating. And uh, when you sit in this chair, um, <laughs> people, uh, our residents uh, want the mayor to do something. And honestly, it has not been uh, the easiest uh, and, and things have now improved, but unfortunately we, we had to go to um, uh, a move on petition uh, that we plan to present to the Michigan uh, Public Service Commission as well as the DPE. That, that and going on uh, one of the local news channels uh, to express our frustration um, did ca catch the attention of DTE. And I know I, um, <clears throat> uh, I, I'm not gonna take uh, credit for some of the responses that have happened since. Um, other mayors, including um, Vicki Barnett in Farmington Hills, and as you mentioned, uh, Kelly Garrett, uh, you know, we have really put the pressure on DTE. People to, be, you know, the mid-August storm, and this was the fourth or fifth storm, uh, major storm this summer, um, people were without power eight days. That's not acceptable, absolutely not acceptable. Um, and we're finding, uh, and DTE admits uh, that uh, they have old equipment. And so, uh, you know, there, there's a, a headline that was just very disturbing to me uh, in the Detroit News, Michigan among the worst states uh, for power outages. And we're in company with Maine, California, West Virginia, and Mississippi. Um, and, and talking to DTE executives, they admit that um, they need to do more to replace equipment. And also, um, uh, although they did a significant amount of tree trimming in uh, Southfield, uh, this year, um, this spring, past spring, 
uh, what I saw was not enough. And they admit that it's not enough. And I also think they need to go wider in, in when they clear uh, power lines. So the response from DTE was an announcement uh, last week that they're going to uh, spend uh, or commit $70 million to tree trimming, not just in Southville, but in Southeast Michigan. Um, they're, they're uh, I mean, I, I'm all over the city. I, I, I just, there are plenty of places where we still have trees, in, you know, over, over power lines. Um, and yes, um, we've had a lot of severe weather this summer, um, but this it's extremely frustrating. And uh, as I told DTE, um, I, I have people calling me and saying, um, besides losing food, they've lost medications. Um, and, and what this is, how this has impacted their homes. And, you know, it's frustrating for me because I, and, and any other mayor, uh, when you don't get, a, don't get the response that you want uh, from the utility. And the communication on top of that it was something that was mentioned as a frustrating point as well. Mayor Ken Siver from the city of Southfield with us on the megacast today. Um, and so a few more minutes with you. There's not really a good way to go about uh, addressing these issues or communicating these issues and the issues that the community has with DTE, with DTE directly. Ha has your city's discussions, or any that may be in place from your city or from your partnership with uh, Lathrop Village and, and their mayoral office as well to open some of those lines of communication and give residents a better ability to speak their mind to this provider that they really don't have a whole lot of choice in uh, in uh, utilizing the services of, uh, or at least, or at the very least, to open more lines of communication from municipalities to DTE Energy so that partnership can come into play to address some of these issues on a city to city, municipality to municipality level. So uh, we also contacted our state mm -hmm. Senator Jeremy Moss and our state representative Kyra Harris uh, Bolden. And they have been in discussions with DTE. Uh, I have since had quite a bit of communication after the petition and, and the, uh, the piece aired um, on Channel 4, uh, but uh, they are much more um, responsive. Honestly, I called, I didn't get a return phone call. Uh, and uh, what I've gotten since are um, sincere apologies. Um, uh, I, I, you know, I want to work with these, uh, with this utility and and the, the people that um, work for it. I don't want to be at war with them, but again, uh, the frustration when when you have power out six, seven, eight days, and you don't hear, and then on top of that, their communication system. When you went online and told DTE. Uh, or, or check with DT and, and the message would come back. We're going to have your power on on Saturday morning. Saturday morning came no power. Saturday, you know, there were there were many messages that went out that gave people hope that the power would be restored, and those messages were inaccurate. So that that also uh, has frustrated um, our, our residents uh, when th there's not reliable information and people need to plan you know if they, if they know that they're going to be without power another couple of days then they're going to make decisions about uh, their household uh, food you know on and on and on so um dt admits that they need to uh improve the uh, information system uh, one one person told me uh, as dt official told me they're just going to scrap it and start all over yeah, those lines of communication need to be improved and, and these systems need to be improved. And if it has to happen on a municipality to municipality basis or through discussions openly with the communities that are affected by DTE and the, uh, that particular utility or consumers energy and other local energy utility, these are issues that are continuing to be problematic for people, especially as we have more severe weather and especially as more of in-home life becomes important to out-of-home life as we've had throughout this pandemic 
pandemic with people working from home, being educated from home and spending more time at home as we go through this pandemic. Mayor Siver, we appreciate your time. Thank you for being with us today. I'm uh, happy uh, to be there uh, with you rather. And thank you very much for giving me the time to explain where we're at. Absolutely appreciate having you on. Mayor Ken Siver, City of Southfield. You can find more information about the City of Southfield, what's going on in your community, and how to get in contact with the Mayor's office. If you have issues, for example, with DT Energy that you'd like to address from the city level, that is at cityofsouthfield.com. And of course, you can join us each and every day on City Cable 15 now and throughout the rest of our run here on the Megacast as we continue to talk to people like the Mayor of Southfield and others uh, locally as well as regionally and throughout the state of Michigan as well. That is going to do it for today's edition of the Megacast. I'd like to thank all of our partnering stations, including City Cable 15, Waterford Community Television, Birmingham Area Municipal Access, 88.1 The Biff, My Michigan TV, and of course our flagship stations here, Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM for being with us each and every day. I'll take a quick breath after that long list of partners. And thank our crew, Calvin Brown, our board operator and studio producer, Larry Nyland, our booking producer and our master control producer for today's edition of the program. And of course, all of our guests on today's edition of the, sh of the show, Laura Barnes, uh, Lavora Barnes, the chair of the Michigan Democratic Party, Melanie Ducanel from the Michigan Better Beer Business Bureau, K Karen McDonald, Oakland County prosecutor, uh, join, join us as well in the 11 o'clock hour. I'd like to thank Gina Kell Spain from the New Day Foundation for Families Fighting Cancer and of course Mayor Ken Cyber for joining us as well. Find today's episode as well as all of our interviews on our website at civiccentertv.com slash megacast. For those of you tuning in on Civic Center TV, we have more programming coming up next. For those of you tuning in on My My TV, Steve Latho Live is coming up next and we'll be back here tomorrow morning live beginning at 10 a.m.